All right, we are well after the sermon um, <laughs> this morning. Uh, we, we began to shoot a video yesterday, and, and we actually did. We thought we shot a video, and we didn't. And so I think we got about a minute and a half, maybe two minutes into the video of about 15 minutes. And so we sat here talking to a camera that wasn't on. So it was really good, though. Yeah, it was. It was you life-changing guys... stuff that we talked about. Yeah, <laughs> this will not be nearly as good as what yesterday was. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, we've already slept last night. At least most of us did, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so we've forgotten everything that was said, just like everybody mm -hmm. else usually does after a sermon. You know, so it's probably good that we... We kind of quickly recap. So um, I, I believe the date yesterday was June 14th, if I remember correctly. Nice. And uh, we pre I preached on uh, Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24, particularly verses 18 through 20, uh, dealing with Melchizedek, um, the, the priest there of the king of Salem. And so we, we kind of took Melchizedek and worked our way through the scripture to Hebrews chapter 7, where we, we see that Jesus is that great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So uh, quite a few questions, uh, some things we didn't get a chance to cover in the sermon we'd like to cover now. Uh, one, of the, one of those issues that came up yesterday uh, is, is this, is, is what or who is Melchizedek? We often talk about you know, theophanies, those visions of God in the, in the Old Testament, and Christophanies, the visions of Christ. And so there's a lot of theories about who Melchizedek is. And so, um, you guys, what's the, what's the best understanding of who Melchizedek is? Well, you, you know, uh, I, I think it's easy to look at Melchizedek and, and to use the word Christophany, and I think, or Theophany, and uh, to try to apply that to him. Um, but what's, what I love is that Hebrews kind of lays out for us, I think, as far as we should take that, mm -hmm. right? Because Hebrews says uh, Melchizedek resembles uh, the Son of God, mm -hmm. right? And he, um, uh, because of that, um, we get the sense um, that from the from Genesis, what is going on is that it's being written deliberately to point us to mm -hmm. Jesus, right? So, um, yeah, he didn't have a genealogy, but that doesn't mean he was. Uh, born immaculately, or yeah. he was, right. you know, just appeared out of nowhere. Um, there's other characters in the Bible that also, you mm -hmm. know, the prophet Elijah just appears out of nowhere, but that doesn't mean he was born immaculately. So there's no point in, I think, assigning him to be actually Jesus in the Old Testament. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed just you breaking down, like, his name, like, yeah. King of Righteousness, who was the King of, um, king of Peace, King of Salem. Mm -hmm. Um, was he king of? You say he was king of from Jerusalem as well. Yeah, right? the, yeah. the city becomes Jerusalem. Becomes Jerusalem. Right. Becomes city. Just you see almost like it's it's putting all this weight behind this person. How great this guy is, right? And the point isn't necessarily how great he is in reference to God. Mm -hmm. It's how great he is in reference to this servant Abraham yep. who is coming to. Um, and just how that points you to this whole of scripture that you have the God's people who are under somebody, under something. And I could also point them to Jesus, and I just I don't think it's a really awesome connection. You have Abraham, who is, um, we look back as being the father of our faith, and here we see him being submitted and serving mm -hmm. um, a great, a greater priest of some sort. And how much greater, that's whole, Hebrews, this whole thing. Look at all these great things in the past, mm -hmm. look at Moses, look at all the, but what we have now is greater in Christ. So even this great enigmatic character in Melchizedek, who, um, has titles, accolades, even authority in some sense, is still less than Christ, mm -hmm. who is the, the fulfillment of what Melchizedek was hinting at. Um, so, it oh, wasn't Jesus, I guess. Yeah, but. The, the best answer is, is Melchizedek is Melchizedek. And that, that's who he is in the scripture, and we, we don't need to assign anything else. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says he resembles this, uh, Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, but he also calls him a, a type. Yeah. Uh, the Greek word there is antitupos, and it's he's a type of Jesus Christ. So we see these types all throughout the Old Testament, which kind of brings up another point. We, you know, we if you look in you look in the Old Testament, and you begin to see starting in Genesis three, where the first sacrifice takes place, mm -hmm. and then you see in Genesis four where Cain and Abel are offering sacrifices, and then you move forward and Noah is offering sacrifices, mm -hmm. and Abram. Um, and then Isaac and Jacob, and then there's others that offer sacrifices, mm -hmm. Job. Um, it seems to be there's a progression that takes place in the Old Testament where you have these heads of families mm -hmm. that are offering sacrifices, 
and then there's a change. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a transition that takes place where all of a sudden God now only accepts sacrifices by a particular priesthood, and that's the Levitical, mm -hmm. uh, even Aaronic priesthood, where you have the brother of Moses, who both of them are the tribe of Levi, mm -hmm. and Aaron is the one who carries the line of priest. Even Moses himself is not that priest. Mm -hmm. And so you, you move forward, though, in, in the Scripture, and of course we have Psalm 110 that we looked at yesterday, you're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and then there's another change or transition in the priesthood when Jesus comes. And so Jesus mm -hmm. becomes that great high priest. Mm -hmm. So all of these are, are pointing us there. So, you know, one of the things that was said in the sermon yesterday is that the Old Testament sacrifices, and this wasn't what I, it wasn't my idea, it came straight out of Hebrews 7, that the law didn't save anyone, that the sacrifices didn't save anyone. But what were the purpose, what was the purposes of God in giving those Old Testament sacrifices? Yeah, there's a, a lot of, ways to go with that. I think my favorite way to think about, like the most kind of like simplistic, flat way to think about Old Testament sacrifices in general, even even God's dealing with Israel in a lot of ways, um, is this, I, I remember being young and being in like Sunday school and having flannel graphs. Mm -hmm. You know, teacher would have a green board of some sort, and his little fabric character sheet up, and she would, you know, before we used TVs, I guess, in Sunday school. Um, in a sense to where it's just kind of it's teaching you how this stuff works. Like a lot of the Old Testament, it's giving us a flesh and bone um, dis um, display or demonstration of what's going on spiritually, what God's preparing us for. So, you know, the sacrificing of bulls and goats and sheep, um, those were real sacrifices happening because it was real sin that needed to really be atoned for. And that's showing us with those sacrifices what the true Savior, the true sacrifice, the true high priest is going to have to do for us. The, the consequences for sin, all, all those things have a, it's like an embodied um, object lesson of what's happening um, in the spiritual world and how God works with his people. It has a value, an actual end time value, um, but um, as far as trying to connect to the big picture a lot of times, so I just like, well, that's, so that's what that looks like. If I had to go kill like my favorite animal whenever there was a sin in my life, I would understand mm -hmm. like the sin a lot more clearly. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easier to connect with that and understand the consequences and God's grace and mercy through all of that. So yeah. that's one of my thoughts on it. Yeah. And, and then, of course, that those sacrifices are all pointing to Jesus. He's the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, you know, even the way Hebrews puts it is those sacrifices were not perfect, right? So if, if those sacrifices could actually forgive sins... Um, permanently like they like they should have uh, then it would have been one sacrifice and it would have been done mm -hmm. and uh, of course Hebrews says that didn't happen which is why Christ is that perfect sacrifice who who's died once for all mm -hmm. right you know hunters and fishermen and and others who um, maybe farmers who raise their own food they, they kind of get this something has to die in order for us to live you know we, we go to the grocery store and what do we find we we have this nicely packaged meat and we don't see the animal and you know we, we can't get to know this animal at all mm -hmm. and but when you raise your own food or you kill your own food you really get that picture of, mm -hmm. of death that comes because something's got to die for us to live and yeah. so that's part of that picture too you know, one of the other things, too, talking about the Old Testament is um, those three purposes for God giving the law. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, the law never made anything perfect. So yeah. if the law didn't make anything perfect, why, why did God even give us the law? Mm -hmm. What are some reasons for that? Yeah, well, one use of the law is to restrain evil. Um, the law, not just for Christians, but for everybody throughout all of history is something it's written on our hearts, you know, the Bible tells us, but... Um, also has just worked its way into what human government is mm -hmm. uh, so that we kind of universally understand oh murder murder is wrong right theft is wrong mm -hmm. and um, and the reason for those universal truths uh, is that it's a it's a restraint on our evil and mm -hmm. and uh, if if God did not give that law how how much further <laughs> from how much closer to anarchy would we mm -hmm. you know would we be? Yeah. And one of the, um, I think I was in a class and a professor who was talking about the law and how to relate to it. And one of the things she was highlighting was how <clears throat> um, one of the functions of the law is not just to restrain, to show us what's wrong, 
but positively to show us what's right, right? Show us how we're supposed to live. What does it mean to follow after God? What does it mean to live in the world He's given us according to the the right ways to use it and make mm-hmm. use of it? Mm-hmm. And uh, so He gave this illustration of, um, you know, uh, a milkshake. You know, He gives a milkshake to His son and says, "Hey, enjoy the milkshake," and puts a straw in it. And how is the son supposed to drink the milkshake? Well, so He enjoys the gift through drinking it through the straw. If He chose to take it in pour it out, he would not be enjoying the gift as it was intended to be enjoyed. If he took it and threw it against the wall, he would not be enjoying it the way it was intended. He's supposed to use the straw. In the same way that the point the professor was making to for us was that God has given us a world to walk with him, to know him, to enjoy his beauty, his his gifts, um, his presence. And it says, here's the straw to drink of this. And the straw looks like the Ten Commandments. Like, if you want to know how to thrive in God's creation, how to thrive in with Him, it looks like these things, you know, lying and cheating and stealing, um, adultery, idolatry, um, not resting, you know, all these little things, like, the, it's, it's obvious to all of us, those who choose to pursue those things don't receive, don't walk in the blessings and the goodness of life, but actually bring destruction on themselves those around them and their own souls. Um, so it's a it's a straw. Drink. Good. <laughs> you know, and, and the other part of the, the law, the reason that God gives us the law is one it, it convicts us, right? I mean, you know, we one of one of the things that we do when we, when we read the Ten Commandments and we think about just the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Mm-hmm. And how many idols we have in our lives? Uh, how, how many times we've we've put things before God, whether that's in our giving or mm-hmm. whether that's in our Sunday attendance at church, or you know, not witnessing to somebody because we like our comfort more than we in, we want somebody to go to heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there's all kind of things that happen as a result of the law, and mm-hmm. so that law then, because we don't keep that perfect standard, mm-hmm. leaves us convicted mm-hmm. and, and knowing that we have we have fallen short of the glory of God, which is a good thing for us to remember because that drives us to the one who did live perfectly, and that's Jesus Christ, the one who did die for our sins, the breaking of the law. Mm-hmm. And so the, those three purposes are absolutely wonderful for us as, as believers, mm-hmm. you know, the restraining of, of society, the, the, the driving us to Christ, and of course, teaching us God's will are, are always helpful. Um, I think that's probably enough for, for this time, and uh, I'm sure there's more that people want to talk about, and you're welcome to do that in your small groups, and, and uh, those questions will be coming out to you very, very soon, and uh, God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday, Lord willing. Mm-hmm.